population increased by 1,552%. You can see how this is going to affect the population structure of Sabah. Meaning, even the normal growth in Sarawak, Sarawak population originally was higher, but now Sabah population even higher. And uh, today, we find that out of 3.25 million population in Sabah, 1.7 million are foreigners. But that become Malayalized, Malaysianized. In other words, the original population has been outnumbered because uh, um, uh, more than one to one, because the local population is only 1.5 million. So there is a reverse takeover. There you are. So after the population was changed, they took over the oil, what happened, how much oil we get, how much money we have. Last year, of what's counted for this year, we told us from Sabah produce about 28 billion, and we only get 5% or 1.4 billion, where the rest of the money went to Kuala Lumpur. In terms of taxes, they collected 37 billion, all forms of taxes, two years ago. And uh, the income tax department probably announced that their target for 2014 is 40 billion. We got nothing. We are supposed to get, according to Schedule 10 of the Federal Constitution, we are supposed to get 40% of the net of revenue collected from Sala. So, this figure, the oil figure is going to double. In 2015, the production the oil production in Sabah is going to, going to increase from 100, uh, 170,000 barrels per day to about 500,000 barrels per day. So it's going to be more than double after 2015 and it means that the income will also be more than double. So we can say about 50 to 60 billion from oil revenue. So it will combine uh, 50, 60 billion to 40 billion is about 100 billion. We are capable of producing 100 billion in income for Sabah. But in our annual budget, we only have 4.3 billion. All the rest goes to the bottom. So, having done all that, in 1985 86 there was a change of government. In fact, every nine years, the electorate changed the government. But in 1985, the change of government was led by uh, a non-Muslim chief minister to be my brother. So the federal government did not accept this change of uh, leadership. They want to maintain a government led by a Muslim. So they tried all kinds of ways to topple this government, get rid of it. In, in, in fact, from the beginning, they had another, another uh, elected representative to be sworn in as chief minister. So there were two chief ministers at that time. There was a constitutional crisis. And uh, the other one was Tung Mustafa, who did not have uh, the majority. Uh, 
to, to form a government, but he was persuaded to go to the East End. And there was a constitutional crisis, and later on, there was riots in the street. And these riots were accompanied by the police, like as if they were, you know, uh, allowing this to happen. The burning, the procession, and all kinds of provocation. And eventually, uh, 1986, the elected government went back to the people to get a new mandate, and they got a bigger mandate. They had two thirds. Still, Kuala Lumpur did not. They were unhappy. And uh, when Kuala Lumpur uh, insisted to, to suggest what kind of government they should form, then uh, I, who was an activist, I met, uh, I, I was not happy with the federal government, and I said something. I said, you should not treat the state government of Sabah in the same way as you're treating the state government in Semenanjo, because we have an agreement to form Malaysia. We have certain rights under the 20 points. Then what happened? They sent it to jail. This were the rights. Most of these were illegal immigrants. Now, they sent me to jail for three years, and before that, Mahathir called me to his office and he told me uh, why I was indoctrinating the people. <coughs> So Jeffrey, the police report says you are indoctrinating people. I told him, no sir, I'm just trying to uh, teach them how to be self-reliant. I was actually uh, running a program called People Development. Uh, but it was misconstrued. And he told me, Jeffrey, don't teach the people what they don't know. Well, don't teach the people what they don't know. I was surprised. Coming from a prime minister, understand? Keep the people ignorant. Keep the people stupid. Let them not know anything. And this was the attitude that the federal leaders, Kuala Lumpur leaders at the time, including Mahathir. After that, he sent me to jail. So, while I was in jail, they did something uh, <coughs> to take over the government. They actually persuaded Tut Mustafa to allow Omno to come in and under pretext to protect Islam in Zama. Mustafa, before this, actually, uh, did not want Omno to come to Sabah because I personally met him and he agreed to work together with the PDS to prevent Omno from coming into Sabah because he said the moment Omno enters Sabah it will be a different political landscape altogether. So he agreed to work together with PDS but unfortunately at the time when I talked to the leaders of PDS they told me we don't trust him because he went to the uh, to the Istana and got himself sworn in as chief minister. Uh, how can we trust him now? So uh, it was a dilemma. Still, that was taken uh, advantage of by Kuala Lumpur. They brought in Omno. They persuaded Omno to be deregistered and all the leaders and members to join Omno. And then. Uh, Omno was deregistered. And uh, in 1994, when I was released conditionally, they looked for me to negotiate on behalf of my brother to work together in the election. 
But my brother did not trust me anymore because he said that I was already brainwashed by the federal. And because I was in, in, in the ISC for three years, and so they don't trust my judgment. And so he refused to work together. And uh, so what happened? Uh, in the election of 1994, the PBS under my brother only obtained a simple majority, 25. And so, Omno began to work towards getting by over assemblyman crossover. And that's what happened. 1994, uh, they, they, there was a crossover of people, and uh, eventually, the Omno grew the state. And from 1994, Omno introduced the rotation system to get everybody into the government, into Russian National, to support Omno and to have rotation with it. And he said, this is good for you guys. Every community will become chief minister. Rotation, two years, every two years, new chief minister. This actually wrecked havoc in the administration. It was, it, it was against the constitution. It was his own experiment. And while he was uh, attracting people to become chief ministers, everybody was to be chief ministers, so he was planning to get rid of the rotation by having Omno gain many of the seats. So he restructured, there was gerrymandering, he brought in the, the legal immigrant to go into these constituencies. And by the time uh, Musa became chief minister, they already controlled 32 seats, so he said, from now on, there will be no more rotation because now we follow the constitution. So this is what happened. And today, uh, dear friends, Omnoru Sabah, we feel we have been colonized. Our future is a state, our resources have been taken. Uh, we can't do anything uh, to get the federal government to come to the table. All this while, it was impossible because Omno and the Malaysian National have absolute control of parliament. But since 2008, this has changed. Because since 2008, Pakatan came into the picture. Now, in Semenanjung, the seats that we were talking about, the 75% seats, were split 50 50 net. So the seats in Sabah and Sabah have become very important to support whoever they favor in parliament. In fact, the present government is hanging on to power because of Sabah and Sarawak. If Sabah and Sarawak, which have become kingmakers, decide tomorrow to go with Pakatan, the end will be out of power. The problem is, can they do that? How do they do that? Sarawak, which is not under Omno, now asserting itself, demanding 20% of the oil, demanding that the relation agreement be implemented and their rights be restored, is making that stand because Omno is not there. In fact, the Sarawak government said, we don't want Omno here. But in Sarawak, it is impossible at the moment because uh, Musa cannot say anything. Why? Because if he say anything, he will be out of uh, the chief minister's uh, seat tomorrow. I cannot, they can appoint anybody else there to replace him. So this is the game that uh, they are playing. This is the way they are being done into it. But we are going to the people, working with the people, telling them we have to change the government of the state as well. We have to have a new government a political party that is state-based so that we are not subject to war and war. The way we are subjected to now, we want to work with Sarawak. The only way is they have to work with Sarawak. And the only way is also to find a solution for the, uh, for the illegal migrants problem and also to work with other opposition parties. Last election, 
we did not make too much impact because all the opposition parties went on their own. And I can tell you that uh, we have no choice. This time around, we have to work together to change the government of Malaysia and to change the government of Sabah and to restore the Malaysia agreement or to find a solution. Now, a lot of people are calling for secession. There are some people calling for separation. Uh, the, 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 the voices of the young people really wants out. They are more reasonable. I said we have three choices. One, do nothing, but that's not good. Second, sit down and resolve it. We negotiate. Third, you don't do that, then no way, but we have to find our own way. It's like, like a husband and wife, yeah. They can't reconcile, they have to pay us. And this is the way Malaysia is at the moment. And I recommend that we find a solution. And I propose that one of the solutions to save Malaysia is that we need to renegotiate. We need to go back to the original purpose of forming Malaysia, which is to decolonize and then work together. So meaning, I would propose that uh, Semenanju uh, remain as Semenanju uh, uh, government, the Federation of Malaya, with their own prime ministers. Nothing changed. We don't disturb the, the Malay, Malay Sultanate. But in Sabah and Sarawak, they upgrade the residences into states and they form their own central government. And Sabah and Sarawak and Semenanju can then decide what kind of federal structure they want. And I would recommend that the federal government only deals with uh, national defense, foreign affairs, monetary policies. The rest give it to the region, and the region will work with all the states within their control. This means that these regions will be independently run, but they are federated, they work together on an international level, and each region will contribute how much they give to the federal. Not right now, the federal take everything, and you have to beg for your own money to come back to you. And it's, uh, it's a loose lose for us. So this is my recommendation, and hopefully uh, state government, the federal government can sit down together and find a solution. Other than that, I'm afraid that uh, the voices of Frustration, the voices of separation, the voices of frustration in the long run. Thank you. Religion, 
the mill house missionaries came to Sabah and they set up, uh, also that was set up in Australia and came to Sabah. Um, you even, you know, Canberra, you in Australia, Canberra gave us uh, our, our dictionary, our first Kadazan dictionary. And that built something of a bridge between Sabah. The Australians also sacrificed for us in Sinatra. Now, here we are discussing about Sabah's politics and I met Jesse just now, who's a Malaysian turned Australian, who's never been to Sabah, right? But his interest is there. Likewise, all of you all, I assume that you've read about Sabah and none of you are Sabahans, I guess. But you're read about Sabah. Okay, that's good. Good enough for me. Okay, anyways. Um, the two subjects that uh, the university gave, especially the Malaysian interest group here gave, is whether or not Sabah or will influence the shape of Malaysian <coughs> politics and whether or not Sabah will remain that fixed deposit uh, term that Najib and Amno has given Sabah. I will not address what Dr. Jeffrey has addressed because that is the true feelings of many Sabahans. How we felt cheated and how we felt, how awareness has made us feel, especially education has made us realize uh, what has been taken so much away from Sabah. Um, I came to Parliament in the recent general election, 2013. There were only three of us out of the 25 parliamentary seats in Sabah uh, that went to the opposition. Dr. Jeffrey would have been the fourth one if my party did not put the candidate against him. <laughs> we were protected, and if you combine the votes between my party, uh, Kadilan, Justice People's Party, and Dr. Jeffrey, we would have beaten his brother by 7,000 votes. Uh, that would have been a clear signal to Peninsula that even the paramount leader of the natives, especially the Kadazans, the Dusuns of Sabah, were no, is no longer accepted politically. He may, he may maintain as a cultural leader, but no longer a political leader. And uh, I don't want to, I can't say apologies to Dr. Jeffrey. <laughs> that, that is for Anwar Jeffrey to discuss. <laughs> Anyway, there is a need for us to combine in Sabah to make sure that we can shape and influence uh, Malaysian politics. In fact, if you really look at it, Sabah has always been shaping Malaysia's politics in the sense that the federal government uh, has done so much wrong things to us that they were afraid that awareness would come back, would come to Sabah. Um, the rights of opposition where we are, we believe and know today that we should have been equal partners. Um, they, they, you know, they were so afraid that we can influence, even uh, at the way wealth distribution would be shared in Sabah. And I remember long ago, Dr. Jeffrey raised this question. I did raise it in Parliament too uh, about the ten schedule which he mentioned, wealth distribution. Forty percent of Sabah's wealth collected by the federal government should be returned in, in the sum of 40% at least to Sabah. Yeah. Parliament's response to me in my recent question, uh, the Prime Minister's response to me in my recent question uh, as to how much was this 40% between the year 2008 and 2013. Um, sadly, the reply The reply was, between the year 2008 to 2013, the federal government collected 160 million from Sabah, which I, I think is not an actual figure. So they said between 2008 to 2013, that 40% was only 26.7 million. Dr. Jeffrey gave you a huge amount, probably by the billions. There could be a legal uh, reason to that. Uh, Maybe Petronas operates as a, as a separate entity from the from you know the federal collection, and uh, there are a lot of questions as to why this is so. Now they have, like I said earlier, Sabah has always influenced how Malaysia is run, um, even in religion. The word Allah cannot be used all over Malaysia, except with the cabinet's approval under the 10-point solution. I think you all have read that. Now, that is kind of funny because 
why would you have a, an allowance for people to speak Allah through a cabinet policy when the laws allow you already to use the word? And then judicially recently they decided otherwise. But I must say the judicial decision recently on the Allah issue was only to the to, to the adult, a Catholic publication. But it encompasses a far-reaching uh, effect and spin-off uh, because now they will be probably policing churches, even the Sikh temples, and any congregation of people who still uses the word Allah. Now, that's sad that Malaysia shaped itself to one end to allow Sabah and Sarawak to use the word Allah. On the other hand, um, abuses our constitution by defining it to what they want to do. So, will Sabah influence the future of Malaysia? Yes, it will, especially this coming election. Um, I'm proud and I'm happy to hear from Dr. Jeffrey, although we come from different political ideologies, that uh, we have to finally step up and finally do the right thing. The right thing is to work together. Um, three of us from Sabah, representing uh, Sabah Hans as an opposition member of parliament, um, yeah, we have our limitations. Myself especially, my bahasa is horrible. I can't really speak bahasa in parliament. So I've always said, dengan izin, with permission, my lord, I mean, my lord, sorry, the lawyer, uh, um, the speaker, I speak in English. And I think we need more parliamentarians in, from Sabah, especially from the opposition, to say what Sabah should be. Because the rest of my colleagues from Sabah, um, I, I can't say all, but most, are driven by projects. Okay, why I say projects is this. Um, the pop barrel you call it here. A lot of pop barrels are given to the politicians, especially from the ruling front, so that they can maintain their lives. And while they represent their constituents for the five years, this is what they do. They look for projects. And it's sad that when projects finance needs by these people, uh, overcomes what is really needed for us in summer. And that is to shape Malaysia once again. Dr. Jeffrey mentioned of the Malaysian Agreement 1963. I took a bid on November 13 to read it in Parliament. I was very fortunate that before they, before they rejected it, they actually allowed me to read it. So for the first time ever, uh, Sabahan was able to read their thoughts on the Malaysian Agreement. But the debate was not allowed the deputy speaker rejected it. The speaker actually spoke to me the day before and said, I'm going to allow you to read it. Uh, he actually said to me, you want to be a hero? I said, we are all heroes because there's 222 of us who are elected, so we are all heroes out of the 30 million of Malaysians. So in a sense, that, that gave a sense of pride for the first term. And he allowed me to read that. Um, I understood that he and the deputy speaker Another Sabahan, the speaker is a Sabahan. They concur, but unfortunately, the way the National Front works in Sabah, in Malaysia, uh, is, you know, there's a lot of control towards our population. Okay, um, the other thing is, will we remain as a fixed deposit? This is the sad thing about the term fixed deposit. Every Sabahan is really insulted by it. It's like you're a shackle, which is a piece of meat. Uh, <laughs> in this case, you know, hey, fixed deposit, you follow whatever you, you know, whatever you, whatever we want you to do. And it's sad that we have become like that. The 13th general election showed something else. The <coughs> known, I would say, the known design, Sabahans. When I say design, we have the illegal immigrants who have lived long and become nationals, have become residents and citizens of Sabah and Malaysia, and they are entitled to vote. Now, these people uh, voted for the ruling front, whereas a large number of awakened Sabahans voted for both the oppositions in Sabah, the national-based opposition and the state-based opposition. We will never, 